right. Rockstar. Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark. Wait, Anthony. do it again, because I just pointed at you. <laughs> I just threw my index finger into your brain. So I see how this is going to go. All black, you know, say. All black, everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black, everything. All black polos. All black medallions. Yeah, all black. <laughs> Yo. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. The baddest bitch in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call them bitches. That's the name of her book. You I know, but you didn't say that so people don't understand. <laughs> we have Sophia Che. Sophia is telling her story in her audiobook. It's called The Baddest Bee in the Room. I'll just say that. She joins us now. I can see why. I, we feel it just already. looking at you. Yes. I, I just feel it. Whatever your story is, go out there and tell your story. This is how you become who you are. This is how you forge your path. But this is also how we come together by telling and sharing our stories. What is Sophia Chang of Wu-Tang? I would say Sophia Chang is the yin to our yang. She's been that uh, to the Wu-Tang clan for years, though, and will continue to be the yin to our yang. Bomb. Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and welcome to season 13 of Left to Black. And we are honored today to be joined in person by the baddest bitch in the room, Miss Sophia Chang. How are you doing? Dr. Neal, yes. I asked you if you put on that wonderful suit jacket and tie for me and you promptly said, no. <laughs> well, well, that's just because today I just got other shit to do. And, 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 and it did, right, because that's what I had to think about. I had to dress up from other stuff and I wanted to come in a little bit more chill for you because I knew you would come in chill, <laughs> right? So, so I feel out of place, actually. <laughs> I came in casual. Hi, Mark. I am... So excited to be here. Thank I'm you so, so much for, for having you me. To be here. And you know, we had tried to do this two years ago, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. were going to come down I was supposed to be down and here. chop it up with Ninth exactly. and I in the hip hop class. And, and then, and then realness hit. <laughs> um, so it's, it's good to have you here. First thing I want to talk about with this book, right? Cause like everybody listened to the audio version of it first. And, and then there was an actual book. And, and I remember when the book came to the house, and it's like on a table and like my wife's walking oh, by God. and she's like, what? The? So the title's already provocative. The yeah. baddest bitch in the room. You had to use a photo that was just as provocative. <laughs> I don't have step. <laughs> yeah. What was the conversation with, with the publishers when, when you chose that design? Um, so I want to talk about the title first. I yeah. was actually going to call my memoir Raised by Wu-Tang for years. Uh. And, you know, I said to Rizzi, you know, I'm going to call my memoir Raised by Wu-Tang. And he was like, so if you know, you should call it Wu-Tang on my couch because all of us have been on like <laughs> your therapist, you know, the therapist couch. <laughs> and when I sent out that's my... A mini, that's a series though. It is. That's a, it Hulu, is. That's a Hulu series. <laughs> <laughs> Hulu series, Netflix, Showtime, any of you streamers. Um, uh, and then when I sent out my query letter to try to solicit an agent, I put in the subject line raised by Wu-Tang because I knew middle-aged Korean Canadian woman tells her story was not going to grab attention. Right. right? right. Um, and so then I did secure an agent and it was competitive. And then when it came time to write the memoir, you know, I had originally conceived of the book as a lean in for women of color because lean in was clearly not for women of color. Right. right. And then I had this whole proposal and I wrote that book. I wrote that book. And then my editor and I had two editors because I had one on the Hello Sunshine side as well as on the Audible side. And I had an agent and they all came back and they were like, you know what, Sophia Chang, this isn't really working. <laughs> we actually think it should be a traditional chronological memoir. And then we started questioning the title. They questioned the title, right? Wow. And they said, you know, now that we see the breadth of your story, once I'd written it as a full on memoir, now that we see the breadth of your story, Wu-Tang are a critical component of right, it. Right, but it's bigger than Wu-Tang. But it's a big ass story. You yeah. know, I was only in hip hop really until 95. Right. And then I took a hard ride out and I started training in Shaolin Kung Fu and Wu Tang. Of course, they're still in my lives. I just drove to Hartford, Connecticut to see them last weekend. But, you know, they were so formative and I carried them with me and they 
carry me with them. But yes, it's just a small part of the story. And in terms of the cover, um, I sent them a bunch of pictures and I said, these are the kind of images <laughs> that get men in trouble <laughs> with their wives for having the book on their kitchen table. Um, these are the kind of images that define me. And what yeah. I mean by that yeah. is clearly, I am a 57 year old Korean Canadian single mother of two who was out here telling the world mm. without any hesitation, without an iota of compunction, that I am the baddest bitch in the room. And I think that's fucking radical. So if I'm gonna call my book the baddest bitch in the room, what, there's not gonna be a picture? Why the fuck would you waste this, <laughs> right? I mean, this is my fuck you to white supremacy. This mm, is my mm, fuck mm, you to mm, patriarchy. Mm. This is my fuck you to the model minority, right? It's my way of saying, I don't actually give a fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? That cover is not about trying to be alluring and enticing to men. I don't need a book for that. Lately, I've noticed a real disparity between how men and women present themselves. If there was parity, I wouldn't care, but that's simply not the case. Women are expected to come way more dressed and done up than men. If I go to a meeting, attend a conference, or speak on a panel, this is typically how I show up. And then here comes the man, unkempt, in some wrinkly outfit that he looks like he just pulled off the top of the laundry pile with his eyes closed. Invest in an iron, buy a fucking suit, and while you're at it, suck a dick and stop taking us for granted. My name is Sophia Chang, and uh, I'm the bad switch in the So that cover is really just another manifestation of my defiance, how I push up against racism, mm. <laughs> sexism, misogyny, and in particular, the model minority myth. You know, it's really my way of saying, I don't actually give a fuck what you think about me. I am here defining myself. I will not allow the system, the dominant culture, to tell me who I am, to tell me whether or not I am beautiful, whether I'm sexy, mm -hmm. whether I'm powerful. So it's kind of a it's kind of a middle finger. Like I almost did the like I have the hip hop shot of me doing that with like the middle fingers, but I think that they didn't want that on the shelves of Barnes and Noble, my friend. You talk about defiance. Um, in many ways, your family's backstory really does inform that defiance. The kind of choices that your mother, mm. your grandmother made. Mm -hmm right, your, your aunt, um, your father, the college professor. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that backstory. Thank you. I mean, you know, so my father was born in 1931, God rest his soul, my mother in 1932. This is before Korea right. is split. Right, right. And my mother was born in the North and at 14, she was one of 10 siblings at 14. She, uh, three of her, two of her older brothers had preceded her. And then she and her sister, they followed them and escaped to the southern, more regions. And my mother has not seen the rest of her siblings nor spoken to her parents since she was 14. Um, and it was a very traumatic journey. It was very dramatic. And my mother is now 90. And I don't know if you've known folks like this, but her short-term memory is definitely failing, as is mine. Her long-term long -term memory, memory. Right. right? The details, the things yeah. that she yeah. recalls is incredible. And because that stuff is embodied. That's right. right. That's, that's right. It's 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 kind right. of it's yeah. it's written, it's ingrained into your DNA and you carry that trauma right. with right. you, right? right. Um, and my father was, you know, so they both came up during um, they grew up in the Japanese annexation, occupation, colonization, whatever you want to call it, watch Pachinko. Um, and so both my parents, as did everybody else in Korea, they had to learn Japanese. And my father spoke perfect Japanese, like without an accent. And I am really gifted in languages, and I get that from my father for sure. Mm -hmm. So people didn't know from his phenotype that he wasn't Japanese. People didn't know from how he spoke that he wasn't Japanese. And so because he was so gifted in mathematics, he went to a special school, right, with Japanese students. And his teacher did not know that he was, Jap that he was right. not Japanese. Right. And when he discovered it, he was enraged right. and he 
beat my father all the time. He totally hazed him. him. He completely humiliated him in front of the other students. And when he realized that my father was Korean and that he was poor, he said, you know, somebody stole a bento box. Someone stolen a lunchbox. Well, it must be you because you're poor. Where's your lunchbox? My father didn't have a lunchbox, right? So it was humiliation, Mm -hmm. right? It was physical abuse. And yet my parents, you know, my mother to this day, what's quite extraordinary is that there is such a robust joie de vivre, you know? My father loved good food. Like he taught us how to like, he, my father used to sharpen his German knives. You know, we were a middle-class family. We didn't have money for like fancy knives, but he would buy a fancy knife and he would make sashimi. You know, my father would make steak Diane with brandy and the fucking, you know, the steak is on fire and they loved golfing and they loved going for walks and they very much lived in these bodies that carried the trauma, you know, and it, and, and I think it really speaks to the potency of the human spirit and how it moves through these awful experiences and yet emerges on the other side and still appreciates Mm. the little things. Right. The question that repeats itself throughout the book um, and is really a a metaphor for the immigrant experience in the U.S. Where are you from? Mm. Um, and, And let me say, honestly, I've never heard anyone detail or respond to that question in the way that you do throughout the book. And, and you know, my favorite moment, at least in the audio book, might be that, you know, that early moment with Method, right? Yeah. And first of all, you listen to the audio, audio book, it's like, oh shit, that's Method, <laughs> right? Yeah. But that moment where he's like, she from Shaolin, nigga? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. And it's like, yeah, he's repeating it 35 years later, right? But you can literally imagine what it sounded like, you know, with his hulking frame. Yes, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Uh, That was a really defining moment for me. You know, uh, the, it was competitive to get my book. And as you know, I inverted the model, right? Most people do print and then they do a verbatim version of it for audio and ebook. And when I spoke to the woman, the, my editor, Jessica Alman Galland at Audible, the first thing she said was, Sophia, we want to create a bespoke audiobook for me. And I mean, in a flash, Mark Anthony <laughs> Neal, I said, can I have Method Man in my book? Because I always knew that I wanted to open with that story. Okay. It okay. speaks to so many things. That, that story, that's not a story about Sophia Chang. That's a story about Method Man. Yeah, right, because it's, it's not only a protect, you know, he clearly sees you as kin. Mm-hmm. But as you mentioned in the book, he intuitively understood where oh. that question was coming from. That's right. That's right? right. So it wasn't just that you were coming after yeah. my people. It was that you were being an asshole. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> around people that you don't think, you yeah. know, share the same kind of values, et cetera, Exactly. Et cetera, you exactly. I mean, for anybody of color in this country, right, we all know the experience. Like if you ask a white person, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Kansas. That's right. I'm from Louisiana. (laughs) I'm from DC. I'm from New York City. But when you ask a person of color where they're from, it's so loaded. And the truth of the matter is it's often asked with thinly veiled hostility and it's not actually a question. It's more a statement that says, you don't actually belong here. Right. Right? So here I am. And to this day, Mark, I am still often the only woman certainly the only Asian woman in the room when I go see Wu-Tang, just because it's a very male milieu, yeah. right? That's not that's not any knock on them. Any hip hop room that I'm gonna step into, that's gonna be case. I'm, an, I'm an Asian woman, right? So here comes this Asian woman and he, he couldn't place me. I'm not fucking any of them, clearly, <laughs> right? right? You're not a I don't groupie. Work, that's right, I'm not a groupie. I'm not their A&R person. I'm not a manager. I'm not bringing any kind of commerce. I'm not bringing pussy. So what is she bringing? She's not selling weed, right? So what is she bringing? And he had to figure it out because, you know, to to meet an artist is one thing. To go to the studio is another level of access. To go to the lounge in the back, which is where they do their writing or whatever it is, and then for Method Man to be like, Sophie, I want, I just got my video in. I want you to see, see it. it. Right. All of it signaled this woman is significant. Right. right. Right? And so he's going, 
well, who the fuck are you? Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you right. from? And I knew the second he asked him right, where it was coming, where from. It was right. coming from, right? right? But I decided to play it out and I thought, you know, there's part of me that kind of wanted to be, you know, kind of uh, contrary about it, right? But knowing Meth is standing there, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna fall back. This is his house. I'm not gonna do this. This is a joyous moment. And him flying in like he did, and like you said, his hulking frame, I mean, Meth is 6'4". Right. People don't know how fucking so tall, tall those guys is, are. Right? They, he's tall. And <laughs> Tele he's, television height's a little different. <laughs> exactly, and he, you know, it is well known, and I've talked to all of them about this, who's the nicest with their hands? And people say it's either meth or ghost. And I've seen both of them with their hands. You don't want to fucking be on the other side of that. And you don't want to be on the other side of his wrath either. You know, meth is, meth is the man that wrote all I need. Yeah. This gorgeous this passion. This love about passion, song to right. his wife. You know, he is the kindest. He is such an empath. He is the guy, and we know some of these, and they are gifted, right? That makes you feel like the most special person in the room. Yeah. So he just has this empathy about him. And so to watch him transform so shortly, you know, how long had he known that guy? Longer than me, I'll tell you that. And he's a man, right? That's his crew. And I'm somebody that he didn't really know. And so yes, part of it was like, that's my fucking girl. That's my heart right there. But to your point, I am also seeing something foul play out here. Right. You know, he immediately understood the subtext of the query. He got it right away. And that's really about him. I really hope, Mark, that in listening to or reading my memoir available now on Audible and all fine booksellers near you, please go to a local store, um, that people, <laughs> what people get is, I hope they see another facet of Wu-Tang. Yeah. You know, I hope they see the Wu-Tang that only I know. No. Only I see, because only I am given that space and that kind of love. The Asian American woman who survived an assault in broad daylight while on her way to church. The attack now being prosecuted as a hate crime. This surveillance footage shows a 71-year-old Asian grandmother violently shoved to the ground, her purse stolen. Just one of several attacks in California's Bay Area recently. In New York City, there was an 867% increase in Asian hate crime victims in 2020 compared to the year before. This vicious attack, just one in an alarming spike in crimes against Asian Americans nationwide. So much of this book obviously is about being an Asian woman mm. in rooms that you're not thought to be supposed mm -hmm. to be in. Um, but there's a other piece of this moment for Asian women in this country, and, and that is very clearly even post George Floyd, mm -hmm. post COVID, the public violence mm -hmm. against Asian women. Um, how have you processed that, you know, both in, in more broadly in terms of who you are, Sophia Chang, but also in this particular moment where we're supposed to be as a society and a culture beyond this. Right. Um, okay, I'll answer that in a few different ways. At the micro level, Mark, right? In my quotidian life, I mm. live Chinatown adjacent. Mm. And every day there is a line of elderly Chinese folks standing waiting for um, free food. And I am often running, um, walking next to elderly Chinese folks, walking next to the elderly Chinese woman that has the giant garbage bag and she's going through the garbage for recycling, right? And so, number one, they're all really vulnerable. They're of color, they're elderly, right? right? And they're small and they're frail. Right. And Might post, be some language challenges of also. Course. <laughs> and, you know, maybe some of them don't have legal status, right? And then post all of this awful violence, you know, it's been well documented and studied that we tend to have more empathy for those who look like us, naturally. And so I, when I see an elderly Asian woman or elderly Asian man, I want to walk them home. Yeah. And then in terms of me, you know, 
I practice Shaolin Kung Fu now for 27 years. I've never used it. I never want to. I, I get the feeling that you could fuck up a few people. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, I don't actually ever want to strike somebody. I think I would feel yeah, really, really yeah, physically ill. It. Of course, push I comes to shove. I'm, I'm going to do that under extenuating circumstances. But what Shaolin Kung Fu taught me was my uh, instincts are like that. Mm. You know, I can turn on a dime. Mm. I, I'm not, you know, the gym made me strong. Shaolin Kung Fu made me powerful. Mm. So I walk with a certain amount of confidence just about how I could handle myself. If some man comes running at me, am I gonna be able to defend myself? No, but I do believe that I could handle myself okay. Mm. I also think that my comportment, how I physically move through the world and in the street is unique. Mm. And, you know, um, you know, this is in the memoir where Raphael Sadiq is like, you know what, Sophie, it's going to be really hard for you to find a man because you're so hard. And I was like, fuck out of here. I'm not hard. And I call Meth and I'm like, you won't believe what Raphael just said to me. He said, I'm not going to find a man because I'm too hard. And then I just hear this. Sophie, you are kind of hard. <laughs> and I was just in Atlanta and I saw my boy Ray Murray from Organized Noise. And, you know, every single time I fly, I get called sir. Every fucking time oh, I wow. fly. Every time. And Atlanta was no exception. And I was like, Ray, the fuck is up with Atlanta? You know, I got called sir. I always, I always get mistaken for a man. And Ray looks at me and he goes, you do kind of walk like a man, though. So <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? So clearly there is something about my carriage that is, um, it's kind of masculine. And this yeah. was born for sure from being a petite Asian. Right. right. When I was underage and sneaking into clubs and stuff like that. And I had the fucking long, right. perfect right. cascade of right. black hair and China doll and China girl and everything. And I would just like figure out I walk really fast. I can keep my head down. It's a New York thing. And so I think right. the energy right. about me tends um, to be perhaps not so vulnerable mm -hmm. as other folks, especially ones that are more elderly and frail. But if we pull out and I look at the macro of it, you know, I read so many and saw so many accounts of women saying, Asian women saying they were terrified. And that's right. There's that, that's, that's absolutely pervasive in New York, right? But you know, my feeling was, of course I walk with fear just because I'm a woman. Yeah. And it's heightened now because I'm Asian and petite. But my overwhelming emotion was it's fucking rage. I mean, when people say shit like we're supposed to be beyond this, I know those aren't your words. You know, it's just like we're post-racial. What? Who even? Who even created that right, frame? Right. Who? Who even said that we're post-racial? You only say that if you don't walk right. in skin like in ours. Bodies, you right. can only, right. Right. you know, you right. can only be in this incredibly Pollyanna-ish state where you're like, oh, we, 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 you know, we nominated, we elected a black president. We're post-racial. In what fucking world does that make sense to right. you? Right. What is the calculus behind that? Clearly, there's no calculus behind that, right? That's your magical thinking. <laughs> and so, and also the idea, it's kind of like when people say, oh, overnight success, overnight success. Most people that we consider to be overnight successes, they've been, they've been grinding. grinding. Right. They've been grinding for decades <laughs> and God bless them that they had their breakthrough right. moment. It's the same thing. Oh my God, Asians, you know, suffer violence. Certainly, certainly, certainly the Asian experience is not the same as the black experience. Nobody would ever try to make that, right. you know, as an equals, right? A equals B. But to suggest that we don't suffer all different forms of violence, right? We suffer, you know, for sure, those of us who are immigrants, to your point about speaking with accents. I saw people make fun of my parents' names. Yeah. Bomshik and Tongsuk say their names. I saw people make fun of their accents. Mm -hmm. I saw people make fun of how our food smelled. Mm -hmm. And no, those motherfuckers are extolling the virtues of kimchi as a superfood. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. So I was and am angry 
I am angry at the violence. I am heartbroken for the victims. And I am angry at the framing that somehow this is new. And again, this goes back to the model minority myth, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you people are getting all the spots in the specialized high schools in New York. You people are getting all the spots in the Ivies. You people are getting the jobs. And it is true that if you look at statistics, no question that we over-index, but also who is we, right? right? right. Our diaspora is behemoth. It's complex, right. It's right. huge. It's complex, so if you're yeah. talking about Far East Asians, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans, yes, but then let's go broader. Let's, let's talk Filipino. Right? Right. That's right. Let's talk Filipino. Let's talk Cambodian. Right. Let's talk Vietnamese. Right. Let's talk Hmong, right. right? And then if you want to go deeper, Indians, Pakistanis, right. Bangladeshi, and then the stands. Right. Or do we include the stands? That's a massive, massive fucking yep. continent. Right. Right. So the model minority myth, it props us up as being, oh, look how, you know, look how well they achieved. That's why I fucking hated that book, Tiger Mom. Is that what it was called? Yeah. Fuck that bitch. Fuck Amy Chua. Fuck, is that her name? What the fuck <laughs> is that bitch's name? Fuck, fuck that. Like, bitch, if you want to be that mom, Via con Dios, have fun and go with it. But you write a book about it, you write a book about it, and that just reinforces so many shitty negative stereotypes about us because there's no such thing as a positive stereotype. Right. I actually happen to be good at math. Right. We go out for dinner, everybody's <laughs> like, give Sophia the check. I'm like, okay, I'll do that shit, right? And I happen to be really tidy. And I don't think it's clean unless it smells like bleach. I take shit from buffets. I use my paper towels and my Ziploc bags more than once. I fulfill a lot of stereotypes. But the notion, you know, it just gave people space to go, oh, see, that's what we knew about those people. And we should raise our kids like those people. The, it, it, it erases so much of the breadth and the richness of our experience. Right, right. Let me pivot for a moment. The book, of course, is called The Baddest Bitch in the Room. <laughs> and the genius of you, Sophia Chang, is that you were not content with being the only baddest oh bitch in the room. Yes. So you have created a portal uh, unlock her <laughs> as an effort to elevate the visibility and capacity of women of color, mm -hmm. right? In various, you know, entertainment adjacent industries. Mm -hmm. Talk about unlock her. Well, first I want to talk about the baddest bitch in the room. So I'm a writer. I am very anal about language. I do understand that it is a superlative, meaning that there can only be one. But <laughs> to your point, <laughs> to your point, the notion of the baddest bitch in the room, you know, I created this club, so to speak, um, the notion came to me when I was hanging out with Beth Ann Hardison, Sam Martin, and Joan Morgan. Huh? And homie. Went, What's up, homie? Hey, Joan. And I went, oh, my bitches are the baddest bitches in the room. And we're all over 40. Yeah. Right? Um, three of us are mothers. We are all Hell, women. Beth Ann is over 70. <laughs> Word. We are all of, sorry, Beth Ann. We are all of color. <laughs> and just the notion that we can make this very mm. potent claim in the face of all the things that I talked about, racism, ageism, and sexism, right? And my hope is that everybody in the world, particularly women of color, will be inspired by me. That's what I'm out here doing. I am inspiring and empowering and uplifting, right? So when women on the street walk up to me and they're like, you're so inspiring, I'm like, Allah Akbar, God is great. I am doing my work, right? I want everybody to find the baddest bitch in the room. In terms of Unlock Her Potential, this is a program that I founded in 2020 that provides free mentorship for women of color and you are coming back for your third year. God bless you. Thank you. I have been mentored for 35 years by Michael Austin who is the son of the late, great God rest his soul, Mo Austin, the founder, uh, the chairman, legendary chairman of Warner Brothers Records, probably the greatest record company man that I've ever met, had the privilege of meeting. Michael was the uh, head of A&R at Warner Brothers Records and then the president of DreamWorks Records. Michael's guidance has been infallible, 
unwavering, mm -hmm. kind, and loyal. You know, in my bio, it mentions that I manage Q-Tip in a tribe called Quest. And I actually introduced Michael and Tip, I don't know, maybe back in 92 or something, 91 or 90. And Tip came to Michael and he said, I'd like you to manage me. And Michael said, on one condition, I bring Soph. Hmm. Now, that's a fucking ride or that's, die. That's, that's, that's generosity. It right. is. That yeah. really shows up. And I'm glad you used generosity, not charity. It wasn't like, I'm just going to bring Soph along and she can just ride on my coattails. He knew that I would do the work. But the fact that he placed it in there as a caveat, as a stipulation, this is not negotiable. Yeah. This is not me just making a suggestion. I am telling you, he's Michael Lawson. He can do whatever the fuck he wants for the rest of his life. Yeah. He doesn't need to manage right. talent. Right. right. But he wanted to and he chose to. And having that kind of guidance and having somebody put a battery in my back like that, this is what I wanted to share. And the program, as you know, has been an unmitigated success. We are going into our third year. We got almost 2,500 applications wow. this year. It was massive. A big wow. part of that is our volunteers. You know, we have this incredible army of volunteers. And our socials team, they're fucking right. beasts. Right. You know, they were like, we're going to post really aggressively. And it really, it was really beautiful. And I'll tell you, Mark, that I knew, I knew when I created it that I was creating an incredibly exclusive club. Yeah. And the fabric that holds this club together is all of us having a really earnest, serious belief mm -hmm. in the importance of mentoring women of color. Mm -hmm. You know, I secured over 100, 100 mentors in less than 72 hours. <laughs> I just literally, I called you, I texted you, I was like, homie, call me, homie, call me. And yeah. every single one well, of you said, of I'm course. in, right. I'm D, just tell me what it is. And now, and even in year one, but it's been amplified in going into year three, there are so many people that want to be mentors. Right. People I don't even know saying, <laughs> how can I be down? People who themselves could be mentors. That's right. That's <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so there are all of these people saying, I want to be a mentor, right? And one of the things that is really important to me and our mentors is it's not enough that you're gifted, right? So we could, you know, you could say to me, Sophia, there is this person and they are the most gifted screenwriter, poet, right. novelist, essayist. Um, they're 23, they just graduated from Duke. They're incredible. What do you think of them as a mentor? And I would say to you, I would read and I would say, you're right, they are tremendously gifted but they can't be a mentor because they don't have institutional knowledge. Mm. So our program isn't just about, I'll teach you how to write a screenplay. I'll teach you how to shape your ideas around film. Our program is also about, let me show you how to navigate, navigate. an industry. Yeah. And right. that takes institutional right. knowledge. Right. I could come to you, Mark Anthony Neal, and say, I am an aspiring academic as mm -hmm. a woman of color. Mm -hmm. What does that look like when the canon and the academy are largely white right. men? Can you right. help me right. navigate that? Right. In addition to, you know, here's my thesis and, right. you know, can you help right. me kind of That's shape my right. ideas around right. it? One of the things I love about Unlock Her Potential, particularly for it to emerge post Me Too, because Me Too has created this kind of moment and, and rightfully so, where we don't know what to do with cross-gender mm -hmm. mentoring. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that you were comfortable to reach out to all kinds of men, yeah. right, mm -hmm. and say it's important that yes. this woman of color right. be yeah. able to talk with you and get yeah. some guidance mm -hmm. from you, mm -hmm. that really cuts across the grain, right? Because mm -hmm. we're fearful now, I think, as a society. Sure of what plays out, you know, in certain mm -hmm. kind of mentoring mm -hmm. relationships. No, I, th I think that's absolutely right. I think we're all more sensitive to everything. Like, um, are we allowed to flirt? You know, I don't mean in mentor s situations. Right, I just, just mean in, general, in any scenario. Just in general, right. You know, um, there are several white men who are mentors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
the reason that we did this, you know, we there's a brain trust. Dr. Treva Lindsay, um, one of your students, um, she, you know, we all talked about what the makeup of the mentors would be. And we all decided it was important to have white men. Number one, they are still gatekeepers, yes, the primary right, gatekeepers. Right, right. So Jim Jarmusch is a white man. <laughs> Michael Mann is a white man. Phil Lord, fucking co-writer and director of Spider-Verse, my favorite Marvel movie, is a white man. Gordon Willby, former CEO of WeTransfer, is a white man. And so they have also, because of white patriarchy, have been able to more easily ascend to levels right. that we are not granted access to. Right. So they are, they have this institutional knowledge that I speak of that they can share with the woman of color, but it is also really important to me that they have these 12 hours of conversation through which they are then compelled to understand what it's like to move in our skin, in our bodies in this world, right? And all of them have said, this has been such a gift to me. Yep, yep. I have learned so much because unless you are of a very specific constitution, unless you engage in what I call cultural curiosity and emotional empathy, as a white man, you have the privilege of not needing to know what's yeah, like right, to be a right. Korean Canadian woman careening through right. middle age, right? right? Unless you actually engage with me. So I consider Unlocker Potential to be bilaterally rewarding yeah. and instructive. And it's, you know, other than my kids, Mark Anthony Neal, <laughs> Unlocker <laughs> Potential is my greatest legacy. I have no question about that. My mentors are my greatest legacy. My mentees are my greatest legacy. Mm -hmm. My volunteers are my greatest legacy. Our community is my greatest legacy because for me, Unlocker Potential is not just about Mark Anthony Neal and his mentee, Sophia Chang and her mentee. You know, that's, that's a limited number, mm -hmm. right? It is also about two things. It is about building community, mm -hmm. coalition, citizenry. It is also about messaging. So when I wrote The Baddest Bitch in the Room, it's not just about the book and the words on the page or the words in the audio book. It's about now I get to talk about it. Now I get to say I fucking exist. Mm -hmm. I want, now I want editors to be like, oh shit, I didn't know that Asian women like that existed. Clearly there are other women, Asian right. women out right. there who have stories to tell that completely upend right. the stereotype right. that we have right. about them. And with Unlocker Potential, it gives me the vehicle to go mentor women of color, mentor women of color beyond my program. Right. Beyond my program, I want, you know, just like CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, and DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, are de rigueur in corporations all across America. I want MWC, Mentorship for Women of Color, to be something that they start to enact, right? I want people to go, what the fuck, who's that bitch? What the fuck is she doing? Let's right. do that here, right? right. right? right. right. To, to understand, and it's not just like, do it because it looks good. Because that's what a lot of people are doing. It's cosmetic, right? It's this temporary tattoo. We've got DEI, we've got our task forces, we've got our ERGs, we've got our fucking, whatever you call it, like, you know, the different um, marginalized communities having those little groups and not getting paid for the work within a company. Um, it's about actually doing it, not as a cosmetic fix, but because it's right and it's smart. Right. <laughs> I have never met anybody more inclusive in activism than women of color, mm -hmm. black feminists in particular, mm -hmm. folks that you raised. And, you know, when we come to a table, we don't just come with our perspective. We come from a place where we want to hear everybody's perspective. You know, the notion of homogeneity around anything, product development, writing a show in a writer's room, you know, creating tech, the mm -hmm. notion of the table being stacked only with white men is baffling to me. Right. How does homogeneity possibly, possibly enrich creativity? Right, or in, create the best that we can possibly Exactly, yeah. how do you not want diversity of perspective? It doesn't make any sense to me. So that's what Unlock a Potential is about. He's trying to erode some of those barriers to entry because they are 
countless and they are formidable. Let us into the rooms and you'll see what the fuck we can do, but you have to let us in there. The book is The Baddest Bitch in the Room and the author is Sophia Chang. Thank you for joining us, Sophia. I love you, Mark Anthony Neal. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad that we finally made this happen. Yes, yes. I'll come back. And we will have you back. Thank you. <laughs> black lights and boots burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back. Black. Thirteen seasons. Thirteen seasons. <laughs> Webby. <laughs> Webby.